Hey, Mike from Prep Pros here. If you aren't already familiar with me, I've been a full-time tutor for over 10 years now. I've scored perfectly on the SAT. I've published a few SAT math books. I've helped students get perfect scores and countless more score in the 99th percentile. So I know the SAT inside and out. What we're gonna cover in this video are 10 tips, tricks, strategies, and a little bit of content that you probably would not figure out on your own they can make a really quick and meaningful impact on your SAT score. If you master what we're gonna talk about in this video, you could improve your score by 50 to 70 points on test day. Now, if you are watching this video, it means you probably procrastinated your SAT prep and there's a good chance you're watching this the night before your SAT or maybe even the morning of your SAT and full-blown panic has set in. If that's describing you, take a deep breath, work through the video, improve as much as you can, but we also wanna take this as a little bit of a learning experience to make sure that we're prepping a little bit better next time. So at the end of the video, I'm also gonna talk about some additional resources that you can use both last minute and as you move forward and you prep for your next SAT. If this is the first time you're taking the SAT, do not worry, it is totally normal to take the test two or even three times, but let's jump straight into it. Now, our first tip is going to be for what I call notes questions, and your tip is going to be do not read the notes unless necessary. So what you're gonna see for about 80% of these questions is you never need to read the notes and you can just find your correct answer because only one will be doing what the SAT wants you to do. So this first sentence is gonna tell you what the SAT wants you to do. The student wants to emphasize a similarity between the two paintings. Well, if we go through our answer choices and we don't see a similarity between two paintings, we can eliminate it. Monkman, a Cree artist, finished his painting in 2019 Lutze, a German-American artist, completed his in 1851. Well, this would be a difference. This would not be a similarity that they were done in different years. Although Monkman's painting was inspired by Lutze's, the people and actions the two paintings portray are very different. Well, this is not a similarity. Lutze and Monkman's paintings are both huge. There's a similarity. Measuring 149 by 255 inches and 132 by 264 inches, respectively. Lutze's painting depicts Revolutionary War soldiers, while Monkman's painting depicts indigenous people and refugees, well, only one answer choice showed a similarity between the two paintings. Therefore, without ever even wasting time reading the notes, we can find the correct answer. Now, there are rare instances where this doesn't work. If you look through the answer choices and two seem to be properly doing what the SAT wants, then it's time to go back, skim through the notes, and only one will actually be accurate. But that is quite rare. So main thing to remember, don't read the notes, go straight to the answer choices. Now, the next thing we're gonna talk through is actually four tips, and these are gonna be around the most important Desmo skills we can quickly learn, which show up on pretty much every single SAT. And the first one we're gonna start with is function. So here, you can see we're given this function and we're asked for f of negative six. All you're simply gonna do is you'll type your function in the first line, and then you're simply gonna type in f of negative six and it will literally spit the answer out for you. Now, our next Desmos hack is gonna be around equivalent questions. So if it says which answer choice is equivalent to whatever expression, you're gonna type your original expression in, you're gonna add sliders for the variables, and then I always just recommend using like two, three, and four, just so you have different values. And all you now need to do is go to your answer choices in whichever one when you type out equals this exact same value that tells you that they're equivalent. So it's really helpful for some super challenging questions. We can see that C is our correct answer because A to the fifth, G to the negative six, and N to the second equals the exact same thing so we can find our answer really easily. This most tip is going to be for algebra questions. So here we see we're looking for what is one possible solution of the absolute value of X plus eight equals 16. The tried and true way you can always get points of interest that you can click on to find your solutions is you're simply going to set each side of the equation as y equals and then the x coordinates of those points of intersection are going to be your solution. So here you'd have two possible correct answers, negative 24 or positive 8. This would be the exact same way you could approach this question if instead it was just x plus 8 equals 16. What is the value of x? We would simply remove our absolute value bars and now we would see that our solution is gonna be at positive eight. There's a few other ways you can do these, but this is the way that's always gonna let you click on the point and find your solution. Any sort of algebra question, you can do this way. Our final type of question is system of equations, and you can always use these in Desmos, but one thing we've started to see more on the test 
is the SAT kind of making where you have to take a step to make stuff Desmos friendly? So here, since we see the 4a plus 3b equals 22 and the 3x plus 2y equals 16, if we want to do this in Desmos, we're going to just turn our a's into x's and our b's into y's. Then all you have to do is find the point of intersection. So this is going to tell us that x or a is 4, b or y is 2. So since we're looking for a plus b, we're simply going to do 4 plus 2, and that will give us our correct answer of 6. Now, our next two tips are going to be about general strategy and understanding as it comes to the reading and writing sections. Now, the first thing we want to do is we do not actually want to do the questions in the order they're presented because this creates a lot of timing challenges for students. The reason this creates timing challenges is the first anywhere from four to six questions are going to be these word and context questions where you're essentially just picking out what vocab word fits best in the context. Now, once you see your first reading passage, they're going to be very easy to see because you're going to have a reading passage, a question about them. Then what I always recommend is to jump up to question 14. If this already starts your conventions of standard English grammar. Just go back to make sure, cool, 13 was our last reading question. Then you're going to work questions 14, 14 through 27. And then once we get up to question 27 and we answer it and you go here, then you're going to jump back to that first reading question and you're going to work through the rest of the reading questions in order. This makes it a lot easier to pace the test because these reading questions take a ton of time. And especially when students aren't familiar with the SAT, it's really easy to get stuck on these and then get to the grammar questions, look at the clock, only have like 10 or eight minutes left over and panic sets in and we start making a lot of mistakes we wouldn't normally make. We're better off to know how much time we have left for the reading and then work through there. Generally speaking, if you can be anywhere, especially when you haven't prepped a lot, having anywhere from about 16 to 18 minutes left over for the reading, you're going to have plenty of time to finish those questions. Now, our kind of next tip is going to be about the reading in general. Now, the most common complaint and challenge I see from students when they're getting used to the SAT is they feel like multiple answer choices could become correct. So we're not going to dive into a ton of the details around the different types of specific right and wrong answers you can see. But your very simple principle that you can apply with the SAT to help you get more reading questions correct is whatever you are going to pick needs to be 100% representative in the passage. The way the SAT creates most of their wrong answers is they're going to have some element of truth based off what's in the passage, but they're going to start putting in details that can no longer be supported. So if you look at your answer choices and you start feeling stuck, try to work in reverse. This is essentially another tip and find what makes answer choices wrong because that often is easier than finding exactly what makes answer choices correct for the most challenging reading questions. Now our next tip is going to be to learn your clauses and how to connect them. This means you need to understand how to identify if something's an independent or dependent clause and the rules around connecting them. If we can do that, we can really easily start to find correct answers for about 30 to 40% of the grammar questions that you can see on the test. And this can make a huge impact on your score. Now, I'm not going to run through how to spot those and the rules around connecting them in this video because in the free trial to my ultimate SAT course, all of that is covered in depth with a ton of practice. So we're going to make sure you can execute it on test day and it's totally free. You don't need to enter any credit card details. So make sure you check that out at the end of this video so that you can make sure that you feel comfortable understanding exactly why C is correct and all of these other answer choices are breaking our rules. What you're most likely currently doing is trying to sound this stuff out and that's going to set you up to fail on test day. Now, we're going to talk about a little bit of a more advanced Desmos hack here and this is going to be the automatic regression tool. We're only going to worry about this for linear equations but here we see the graph of the linear function g in the xy plane passes through the points negative 3 comma 39 and 0 comma 3. So you're simply going to type table in and you're going to put those two points in. And now what you're going to see is this little button is going to pop up. You're simply going to click add regression and it's going to solve for the entire equation of the line. So our equation is y equals negative 12 x plus 3. That means our correct answer is g of x equals negative 12 x plus 3. Anytime you're given two points and it asks for the equation of the line, you can use this really amazing trick. Now our next test tip is make sure you know how the blue book act actually works. And this mostly occurs in the math section, but if you want to get your Desmos calculator, simply click calculator. You can minimize it or maximize it. And the other really simple one is be aware that there's a reference sheet with a ton of helpful formulas. If you've taken any blue book test, this may feel really basic, but a ton of students aren't familiar with this. Now our next test tip 
is do not sit on questions you don't know how to do. This is one of the most common mistakes that both really new SAT test takers make on test day and more seasoned test takers make because they really wanna get everything right that they can. But if you look at a question and after about 45 seconds, you have no idea how to solve it, take your best guess, put it in, mark it for review so you can come back to it if you have time left over and then move forward. Because the worst thing you can do is run out of time on question 18 and then maybe you know how to do 19, 20, and 21, but you didn't even give yourself the opportunity to see those questions. This is the same in reading and writing. If you get a super difficult reading passage or a grammar question you're just totally stumped on, take your best guess, move on, come back to it, avoid sitting on questions. It's a lot easier to use your remaining time and then attack those questions then end up having to rush through a lot of questions and make a bunch of mistakes or not even be able to bubble in answers and you're going to leave a lot of leftover points on the table. To close out, we're going to talk about two of the most commonly typed missed math question types and making sure you're familiar with the differences between them. And these are going to be the two types of solution questions. Now the first type is going to be related to quadratic questions. So if you see any sort of x squared term and it asks about the number or types of solutions, this really means you're actually dealing with a discriminant question. So you absolutely want to make sure you memorize these rules. So here we say in the quadratic equation below, z is a constant for what value of z will the equation have one real solution. This means you're simply going to do b squared minus 4ac and then you can solve. So we always need to identify our a, b, and c values have the equation set equal to zero. So we're going to subtract over the three. That will give us zx squared plus 6x minus three is equal to zero. So our a value is z, our b value is six, and our c value is negative three. So we're now simply gonna do six squared minus four times ac times z times negative three. And here it's gonna be equal to zero because that's what we use for one real solution. This will give us 36 minus 12, plus 12z, excuse me, is equal to zero. We can subtract over the 36, we'll get 12z equals negative 36 and that will give us that z is equal to negative 3 and that will give us our correct answer of a. Now the other type of solution questions is with linear equations and there's kind of a few different ways we can think about this. So this is kind of a box from our book which breaks down the rules and I'm also going to write a few situations out so it's easier to follow but essentially one solution it means your x terms are going to have different coefficients. If you like to think about these graphically that means they're gonna have a different slope. If they're gonna have a different slope, they're gonna cross paths in some way. If we have no solutions, we're gonna have the same x terms, or we can think of it as our slopes are the same, but our intercepts are different, so we're gonna have parallel lines. If we have infinite solutions, it means everything's gonna be the same. So here, if we're saying the equation below has no solution, and a is a constant, what is the value of a? What this really means is the only thing that we have care about being the same is our x terms or our slope. So we're gonna distribute through the a and we're gonna get eight x plus six is equal to negative three a x plus two a minus x. And now the kind of tricky part is we only care about the x terms being the same. So as we work through, we're gonna actually basically only pay attention to that. We're simply gonna say eight x equals negative three a x minus x. And now we can solve for a because we do not care about the intercepts here because the question has told us we have no solution, 2a just cannot equal six. So now as we solve through, we're gonna add over the x and we'll get that nine x equals negative three a x. We can divide both sides by negative three x and that will give us that a equals negative three and that will give us, funnily enough, the same number but that will give us our correct answer of a here as well. Now I hope you're feeling a little bit better heading into your SAT. Before we wrap up, I'm gonna talk about some additional resources that can help you last minute improve, and then some general recommendations for the next time you're probably gonna to have to take the SAT. Now the first thing you all should be doing is checking out the free trial to my ultimate SAT course. You don't need a credit card, it truly is totally free, but you're gonna learn those really important grammar rules that you're absolutely gonna see on your SAT. We're gonna cover one of the most commonly tested math concepts in depth, we're even gonna take a look at some advanced math problems that you could easily see on test day. So going through all of that, it's gonna give you some nice quick wins. Now, if you have a little bit more time on your hands, you've got a few hours that you can dedicate, I strongly recommend checking out my SAT crash course. It's really designed for basically this situation where we're up against the test, we haven't prepped as well as we can, 
but we want to just learn the stuff that's going to show up every SAT and we're going to cover all the content and strategies that are going to give you a lot of quick wins and can make a really significant impact in your score essentially overnight. So I strongly recommend checking that out. Now, as we talked about at the front of the video, you're probably going to have to take the SAT again if you're cramming. So if you're going to be taking the SAT again, make sure you subscribe to our channel so you get a lot more helpful feedback. But I also strongly recommend checking out our ultimate SAT course. It's really going to teach you everything A to Z that you need to prepare for the test. We have a lot of really accurate practice tests in there that truly reflect what you're going to see on test day. It's also going to provide study plans to really help you structure what you should be learning and how often you should be doing that work. If you guys have any questions at all around anything SAT related as well, drop them in the comments. And after you finish your test, please let me know if this helped you out a little bit or if you have any questions heading out of test day.